Welcome again to another chapter and podcast of Cosmic Careers with your hosts, Veronica Chiaravalli and myself, Alistair Brown, the author of the original book of which this podcast is based. This podcast series now has a new name, simply Cosmic Careers Podcast with Alistair Brown, mainly because that's what it is. Hello, everyone. Today, we will finally talk about the most important aspect of settling space, constructing space habitats. If we are going to work in space, we have to live somewhere in space. In this podcast, we will discuss the construction of space habitats or homes, and we are in for a big surprise. It's not going to be the type of habitats you think. You would imagine building something like the International Space Station with components for habitation. They would have something like this on the Moon and Mars, building shelters and burying it with regulus for protection against radiation and have artists and interior decorators design the insides of these habitats. But in space, it will be a very different matter. This will be a totally new and different concept, thought up by the late Gerard O'Neill, a physics professor from Princeton University. He felt that settling planets would mean leaving one gravity well, Earth, for another, like the Moon and Mars. He felt that it would be a waste of energy and resources to do this. His question was... Is the surface of a planet really the right place for an expanding technological civilization? So the choice for future civilizations would be the moon, Mars, or somewhere else, like space. There is an infinite amount of space in all directions for humans to expand. Now, I don't agree with O'Neill's concept as the only alternative. I believe that we should settle on the moon, Mars, and other planets, But this is a good alternative, in addition to all the other options, but not instead of them. I would like to state that we will not discuss regular habitats like on the ISS or on the Moon and Mars, for these proposals for these modules are already constructed or are in the work, so I don't feel I need to mention them any further. This concept of O'Neill space habitats is the ideal place for people to work in zero gravity and when their shift is done they can go home and lay back in a one gravity environment and at the same time protect their bodies from bone deterioration and we've discussed this in the previous podcast this is one answer to that problem A lot of what I am going to describe may be difficult to imagine, and since this is a podcast, not a video, you may want to see videos on YouTube about the habitats I'm about to describe to get a clearer understanding of all this. Better yet, I highly recommend you obtain a copy of The High Frontier by Gerard K. O'Neill. I usually don't recommend other books on my podcasts, but here I am willing to make an exception. It is illustrated and will give you a more detailed description, and it will astound you. Of course, you can also use your own imagination. I did have the privilege of meeting Dr. O'Neill at a conference in 1985, and he gave a lecture on these concepts to the last detail, and it was amazing. What exactly are the three types of space habitats in these unusual concepts? There are the Bernal Sphere, the Cylinder, and the Taurus, and these are a lot more complicated than they sound. That I can imagine. You can start with the Bernal Sphere. The Bernal Sphere consists of a sphere, obviously, with ends on opposite sides, like poles that we have on planets, but flattened. This would be to provide light for the sphere's population. On both sides of the interior, near the poles, are, after the sun windows, are space factories, closest to near zero gravity, and then, as we proceed further down, are recessed areas for agriculture, and then, at the equator, would be the habitable area for population settlement. With all of this, the sphere would be self-supporting, like all habitats. The environment would be on the interior of the sphere. 
the circumference of the sphere at the equator would be a little over a mile. If the sphere were to rotate at one revolution per minute, the equator would have the Earth's gravity. As you move from the equator to the poles, the gravity would decrease until you reach zero gravity at the poles. The poles would be the ideal place for space factories that manufacture products requiring zero gravity, like medicines, alloys, and crystals. Here, one can work a shift, then come home to one Earth gravity and keep physically fit. Now that part for humans to settle would be from the equator to, say, halfway up to the poles, with one half Earth gravity. The human body, I think, and this is just a guess on my part, could adjust to the constant mo movement between gravities. The area on the interior of the sphere would be covered with lunar regolith and grow trees, grass, even crops, and create waterways, parks, and build homes, shops, and theaters. Can you imagine a ballet performance in low gravity? This would look like a village in the countryside, each person having their own individual housing unit. The horizon would curve up instead of down, like all O'Neill space colonies, and there would be enough room to fit 10,000 people comfortably. 10,000 people in such a small area, but if you do the math, the area would be bigger than you think. When dealing with alternating gravities in a sphere, you can always make the sphere bigger. What about the cylinder? The cylinder requires more advanced technology as we technically evolve in space. Picture literally a cylinder with a diameter of 4 miles and a length of 20 miles. The land area on the interior would be 250 square miles, but the interior would be divided by the length of the cylinder into six subregions, three valleys to cover with lunar and or asteroidal soil to plant forests, create rivers with hills and valleys, if one so desires. The other three would be windows to let in the sun, allowing for a day and night cycle. These would alternate between windows and valleys. On the windows, there would be full-length panels of mirrors to open and close over the windows to allow for the sunrise to sunset cycle day and night. The cylinder would rotate, allowing for Earth gravity, but in all parts. The land areas would allow for a total of 400,000 people to live in comfort. There would be many communities in all three valleys, possibly in small cities, but there would be access from one place to another, all over the cylinder. A regular or beaded torus connected above the axis facing the sun would be used for an agricultural area. Electric power would be underground from external power stations over cables laid as the community is built. Two of these cylinder habitats could be connected side by side by a cable with opposite rotations. What would the people here do for work? The work people would do in this environment may depend on the situation in space as a whole. Bernal spheres would be ideal places for space factories, but the cylinders may be a different set of circumstances altogether. There could be situations where the inhabitants could commute for months at a time, either to mine the asteroids or build new structures in space, or they could do white-collar jobs in the habitat itself, and there would be plenty of these. Tell us about the last form of habitation, the torus. The torus would be shaped like a wheel on the outer rim, a central hub on the axis, a diameter of over a mile with a circumference of over three to four miles. The outer rim, or tube, would be over 400 feet in diameter. The hub, the center of the habitat, would be connected to the outer wheel by six spokes. It would have recreational areas, low-gravity gymnasiums, and swimming pools. The hub would also serve as a docking port for passengers or freight. The spokes would be passages to the main wheel. 
Like all other forms, the wheel would be covered with lunar and or asteroidal soil with access to the sun, and the environment would be shaped with rivers, lakes, trees, parks, gardens, farms on terraces, and housing up to 10,000 people. Dr. Jared O'Neill had this all planned, and it seems to be the answer to the problem we've discussed about living and working in space in the previous podcast. It is the answer. Complicated, but it's a start. All of these habitats would have to have a day-night cycle, and the regolith would protect inhabitants from solar and cosmic radiation. The rotation would provide normal Earth gravity, being the answer to human bones deteriorating in space due to low or zero gravity. It would be complex. Building these habitats will have to start with a strong foundation, and that in itself would be difficult. However, I'm sure the people at Princeton, following in O'Neill's footsteps, have made plans on how to accomplish this. O'Neill did establish the Space Studies Institute at Princeton, working on structures like these and creating the proper blueprints or plans for all this. It would be complex building these habitats, but like you said, I believe it is already well thought out and written down and illustrated. You have to look up O'Neill Space Habitats for further information on this. Now I can give you a spiel on this. The habitat would have to be tough, making it fail-safe, heat and cold resistant, and be able to keep the atmosphere. Building these habitats must start with a strong foundation, withstand meteor strikes, where, should one occur, the inhabitants would be alerted and a repair team could easily deal with the damage. It would be minimal, regardless of the size of the meteor, and it would be easy to repair strange but true. The air would not flow out that fast. In fact, it would be a very slow leak, easily detected and fixed with plenty of time to spare. Replenishing lost air would be no problem. Bigger meteors could simply be deflected. Most of all, it would have to be made from resources from the moon and near-Earth asteroids. Nothing from the Earth would come up because of the weight of the materials and the cost of launching them from Earth. Note that I've mentioned that the soil would come from the moon and asteroids, and so would the water. One could also form habitats like these from a small asteroids, its surface providing the best protection of all. And who would live in these habitats? Anybody and everybody from Earth. No kidding. Eventually, there would be tens of thousands of these habitats, all floating around the solar system, exploring it, trying to use what's available out there, and learn from it. Each O'Neill space colony would have its own government, set of laws, and culture. People from all over the world, some exiled groups from their homeland, different Earth cultures wanting to continue their traditions, Others just wanting to go elsewhere, all congregating in one habitat or another, each seeking others like themselves to settle in, others not caring where to go, but all this would be humanity migrating into space. Of course, the Moon and Mars would still be settled. This is just a third alternative, into space itself. Now that you made it clear for all of us, what's on for next time? Next week, just this once, we will divert from the book. Call it a bonus podcast. It would be about building a civilization on the moon right from scratch. You are going to find this very interesting. Thank you, Alistair. This was an interesting podcast, as usual. Thank you, Veronica, and thank you, the listeners. And before I go, I would like to remind you to buy my book, Cosmic Careers, of which this podcast is based. You can get it at your local bookstore or online. Goodbye until next time. Goodbye.